Well, it's working better now. Earlier at the 8.30 mass and at 10 o'clock mass, it was a little more cloudy. But I'd like you to take a look at the stained glass windows. They were put in in 1935. The church was built in 1925. And at that time, the, the windows were like they were in the vestibule over the doors. They were translucent glass. They weren't stained glass windows like this. That's more authentic to the style of neo-Gothic architecture. But people in the, in the 30s wanted to have stained glass windows in their church. So they, they had these installed. And, and they're a wonderful treasure for us because they're so beautiful. They were designed by a German company. And they had, an, they had a factory in Chicago. So we don't know whether they were made in Germany or in Chicago. And whoever designed them had a strong sense of imagery, or what, what is technically called iconography, the symbols that are placed there, the, the biblical scenes. And in, in, the, in the aisle, they relate to one another across the aisle. And I mean, we could go on and on about that, but, but, but I won't, OK? The point is this. Oh, and one last factor. Uh, we had him appraised uh, a couple of years ago, and he told us they're worth about $1,200 a square foot. So they're a real treasure for us, and a real treasure for us to pass on to future generations. But the point of it is this, that if you were to, if you were to come here uh, at the 8 o'clock mass tonight and look up there, all you would see would be big black panels, because there's no light coming through the window. huh? Or if you go outside now and look at the windows, you'll see the plexiglass. You won't see any color. You might see a little bit of the tracery, but you won't be able to see the designs. You won't be able to see the stories that they tell or the wonderful jewel tones that are there. You have to have the light streaming through. Now, now at night, they're still going to be there. The images are still going to be there, but they're not going to be able to be seen from inside the church because they're not illuminated. Now, the point of this whole thing is that that's what happens in the gospel today, in this transfiguration story, because Jesus is always the fullness of the glory of God. But on this mountaintop, this trio of disciples, Peter, James, and John, see him because the glory of God is shining through. Now, it's not Jesus that changes. It's their understanding. It's their perception. It's their being able to see their insight into who Jesus is that changes, their perception. Now, someone has analyzed this, um, these transcendent moments, and they say they have certain qualities. The first one is that they're mysterious, or they use the word ineffable. In other words, you can't analyze them, and you can't even discuss them. You have to discuss them with poetry or with imagery or with metaphors. You can't just put them into simple sentences. The second one is that they're, they're transient. They don't last long. You have to be aware of them because they're going to be gone soon, so you have to open your mind and your heart to them. The third one is that they are we're passive. We don't create them. We can't achieve them. We can't make them happen. They're a gift to us. They, they're, they're given to us, and we have to be open to receive them. And the fine, final thing is that they have something to teach us. There's a lesson there. There's an insight. In other words, we never look at something the same way after we've seen that as we did before. And, and so what the whole, all of that adds up to is that it's a transformative event. It changes us. And that's what happens on this mountaintop. Peter, James, and John are the ones who are changed in their understanding of who Jesus is. But Jesus says to them, that Peter starts babbling as Peter always does. Oh, oh, oh let's, let's stay here. Let's build three tents and let's stay here. And Jesus, as a friend of mine always says, you, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Huh? And that's what Jesus says. We have to go down. We have to go back to work. You have to go down into the valley where the work has to be done. And so that's where Jesus is sending him. And that's where Jesus sends us. You see, we come here maybe week after week or in some other church we gather as the Christian community. And hopefully in those gatherings we have some little glimpse, some little moment of transcendence. Maybe we see God, we experience God, we feel God in, in the music or in the stained glass or in the community or in the proclamation of the word or in the reception of the sacrament. Something that that makes us feel that we're closer to God or that the God who is always there, that we're open to God's presence. Hopefully we have that experience. But you can't stay here, you see. We have to leave when this service is over because we have to continue the Mass out of the world. We have to go down the mountain into the valley like the disciples and do the work that's set before us. And then the question is, well, what is the work that we have to do? Well, there's lots of work to be done. But I would like to focus on one thing today, 
And that comes from the first reading. Because we have another story of another mountain. And we know as soon as we hear in the scriptures a mountaintop, we know it's a setup. We know something important is going to happen. God is going to be there and something's going to happen on that mountain, whether it's with Moses or on Calvary. And in that first reading, Abraham invites his son Isaac to go on a field trip. And it's the last time Isaac will ever say yes, huh? So he takes him up this mountain and they get to the top. And God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son to trust him so much, and Abraham trusts. And Abraham trusts him to the point where he's willing to give up his son, his future, his hope, his posterity. And then the angel stays Abraham's arm before the sacrifice. And scripture scholars tell us that this story in the scripture, in the Hebrew Bible, is the lesson to Israel that God does not accept child sacrifice. God does not want child sacrifice. And we might say, of course not. Of course, God, who's all love, does not want child sacrifice. That sounds so barbaric. It sounds so primitive. It sounds so violent. It's, it sounds so archaic, so foreign. Really? You think so? You think it was long ago and far away? No, sisters and brothers. There are still children being dragged up the mountain and sacrificed to the false gods of our time. Children are being killed. They, God did not want his own son crucified, and yet we continue to crucify the innocents with a disregard for human life and human dignity, because of our lust for power, because of our materialism, because of the violence in our world. Children continue to be sacrificed, the slaughter of the innocents, the slaughter of the unborn, millions and millions of unborn, of refugees, of children who will die today because they do not have enough food, although this world could produce more than enough food for every human person to eat. Children who will die because of dysentery because they have no access to clean water. Children who will die because of human trafficking and sex trafficking, perhaps not die in their bodies, but in their minds and their hearts, they will be slaughtered. Children who will be slaughtered in our schools, by weapons. Yes, sisters and brothers, the slaughter of the innocents continues today. And we might say, well, well, we don't perpetrate those acts. We're not responsible for that. But what we are responsible for is to stop them. We have to be the angel that holds back the arm, like the angel held back the arm of Abraham and said, this will not do. This cannot happen. God does not want this. We have to do everything we can to put an end to this senseless slaughter of children of the innocents in our world today. In the th second century, the Bishop of Lyon, Irenaeus, said, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. In each and every one of us, the glory of God shines through us like the glory shines through these windows. But these windows can be darkened by death. By, 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 by night, just as the glory in us can be darkened by death, by sin, by fear, by ignorance. Lent is this time of transformation for all of us. We are called to let the glory of God shine through in our lives and in our actions. And through us, we are called to let the glory of God shine through in our sisters and in our brothers, and especially in the little ones.